Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my fellow young leaders and participants uh, of the conference. My name is Mark Donfried, uh, director and founder of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, and it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to welcome all of you here uh, from almost every continent of the world, I think we've achieved, uh, for the conference. Uh, the conference, as you know, is called the 2012 Cultural Bridges Conference in Germany. Multiculturalism, the 2012 Global Debate, Strengthening Intercultural Relations. This is a topic that I think is very important, uh, not only for the world, uh, but also for Germany, as well as Berlin. As you know, Berlin used to be the city that would divide two worlds, uh, really with the wall running straight through it. And I think today it's evolving to be a city that's really getting to the point where it's bridging many worlds. It's not yet there, uh, but one does really see many linkages, many exchanges taking place in Berlin that of course weren't possible over 20 years ago. Uh, and it's getting more interesting every day. Uh, we have, as you know, the largest Turkish diaspora outside of Turkey uh, is also in Berlin. Uh, and really in every sense, uh, one has a lot of diasporas here. Uh, I would still say it's not as multicultural as it could be. Uh, for me, multiculturalism is really not just living next to somebody, but living with someone. In the sense, really, where there is some sort of an exchange, there is some sort of a cooperation, uh, there is a listening, there is a, a back and a forth. And I think we're not quite there yet. Uh, as you all know, there's been a big debate in Germany as well about integration. Uh, Angelica Merkel famously said that multiculturalism has failed in Germany. Uh, there was a famous book a few years ago from the finance minister, Sarasin, where he was essentially, you know, had a racist thesis that basically Muslims can't integrate uh, which was condemned initially by all of the political class in Germany, however, was a bestseller for over six months in Germany. So I think there are many indications that this debate is really uh, at its high point now. Uh, the questions really are not yet answered. Uh, and I think it's a fascinating time for us to really address this issue. Uh, what cultural bridges already have we seen that have worked? Uh, what cultural bridges do we need to still create? Uh, and it's really in that spirit that ICD is trying to help educate, enhance, and sustain those dialogues with the ultimate goal of building more dialogue, understanding, and trust between all peoples. Uh, for us, really, cultural diplomacy is about exactly that. How do we facilitate access between cultures to allow for that exchange to take place? Uh, and we would argue at the Institute, cultural diplomacy is really needed, not only at a global level between countries, uh, but also at a national level within countries, uh, and even at a local level. Uh, there are sometimes on the same street, you know, in the same block, you know, groups that maybe are not working as well together as they could. Uh, so even in that very local micro sense, cultural diplomacy can be helpful. So it's really in that spirit that I'm happy to welcome you all here. Uh, and I look forward to, I think, a very interesting few days uh, where we've really tried to get uh, speakers, on the one hand, from the German parliament, since we're here in Germany. On the other hand, ambassadors, bringing in international uh, perspectives. And uh, in many ways, our first speaker of the conference, the opening keynote speaker, I think really represents both. Uh, in the sense, he's somebody who I think knows very well uh, the situation in Germany, but also very well the global uh, situation. Uh, he's the longest serving diplomat uh, from Turkey, uh, actually, Mr. Yasser. And uh, what I'd like to do, if you'll allow me, is take a moment to read his detailed CV. Uh, usually we don't do this. Usually I just give one or two lines. But I think for many reasons I'd like to do it, because I think Mr. Yakish not only is a, an expert on this topic, uh, and a man of really tremendous experience, but he's also, I think, in many ways a role model uh, for all of us. Uh, we have many young leaders here from around the world, and I find his story very inspiring. So it's, it's only about a page long, but if you'll allow me, I'd like to just spend a moment to share with you some of the details uh, that brought Mr. Yakish from point a to point Z, and I think it will help to frame uh, not only his keynote address, but also his participation throughout the conference. You, you'll notice he's going to be here the entire time, uh, helping us out also with the panel discussions. I would encourage you to take this opportunity this week to get to know him, uh, to ask his advice, to ask his questions, uh, to get his business card. If he can help you in your career later on, I'm sure he'd be happy to. Uh, but allow me to say a few words of background about Mr. Yasser Yakish. Mr. Yasser Yakish was born in uh, al Kocha, Turkey, in 1938. His parents were illiterate. He completed his primary education in his hometown. He passed an examination to be admitted to the state free boarding school program and completed his secretary education in Bilicek and his high school education in Kutaya. Kutaya. He completed his university studies at the Faculty of Political Science at Ankara University. To pay for his university expenditures, he worked in the Trade Union's Confederation of Turkey as a translator, in an international hotel as a night receptionist, and in the construction site of a French company as an interpreter in the Black Sea town of Pazar. In 1960, he was invited to France for a summer vacation program, Stage de Connaissance de la France, in his capacity as the most successful course member of the Sorbonne Certificate Program for the French Language and Civilization, organized by the French Cultural Center in Ankara. He graduated from the university in June 1962 and joined the diplomatic service after passing the ex examination of the foreign ministry. 
He served in the military service between 1963 and 1965 in the easternmost border stations of Ibis and uh, Dogukapi at the Soviet border. He was posted as vice consul in Antwerp, Belgium, in 1967. In the examination held in 1968 to be promoted first secretary, he was the most successful candidate. In 1970, he became the first secretary of the Turkish embassy in Lagos, Nigeria. He followed with courses in the NATO Defense College in Rome and served as counselor of the Turkish permanent delegation to NATO and the Turkish embassy in Damascus, Syria. He established the COMCEC coordination office in the Turkish state planning office to provide secretarial services to the Turkish president of Republic in his capacity as the chairman of the standing committee of the economic and uh, commercial cooperation uh, of the organization of the Islamic conference and became the first head of this office. In 1988, he became Turkish ambassador to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. In 1992, deputy undersecretary in the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs in charge of economic affairs. He became Turkish ambassador in Cairo in 1995 and permanent representative of Turkey to the United Nations office in Vienna in 1998. In 2000 and 2001, he taught Turkish foreign policy at Bilkin and Hatacep universities and water diplomacy uh, at Hatacep University. Retiring in 2001, he became founding member of the Justice and Development Party, the AKP party, the ruling party. From the date of the establishment of the party in the general elections of November 3rd, 2002, he served as deputy chairman of the party in charge of international relations. He was elected member of parliament in 2002 and became minister of foreign affairs of Turkey from 2002 until 2003. He participated as government representative of the European Convention that drafted the European Constitution. He served between 2003 and 2011 as chairman of the EU Committee and the Turkish Parliament and co-chairman of the Turkey-EU Joint Parliamentary Commission between 2007 and 2011 and as chairman of the French Caucus of the Turkish Parliament. So you can see a very expensive career inside Turkey, outside Turkey, dealing with cultural bridges and cultural conflicts, I think, in a number of different settings. Uh, so very, very well qualified exactly for this conference. I'll mention maybe just a few of the decorations he's received, uh, and then I'll conclude. Uh, he received the decoration of King uh, Abdulaziz of the first degree for his contribution to the Turkish-Saudi relations in 1992. He received the decoration of the Ordin della Stella della uh, Solidarità Italiana, uh, Comandatore, in 2007 from the President of the Republic of Italy. Also, he received the Légion d'honneur, uh, Officier, from the French President in 2009. In addition to his official uh, duties uh, on behalf of Turkey, I'm also very proud to say he's, I think, the most active member of the ICD Advisory Board. If, if not the, then one of the most active. Uh, he's currently serving as the president of the Young Leaders Forums of ICD. Uh, and in that capacity, we've had great cooperations in Turkey, uh, recently in Ankara, uh, in Berlin a number of times, in Washington, D.C. not too long ago. Even in Israel, we actually had the first ICD PISA initiative uh, going to Israel, where we met with President uh, Perez, as well as Foreign Minister Lieberman. So really, in many ways, Mr. Yakish is very, very active and very much engaged in these questions. So the reason I wanted to take a moment to give a detailed presentation is really so you understand uh, who we're dealing with here uh, and really make the most of this opportunity this week uh, to get to know also Mr. Yakesh. The topic that he has cho chosen for his keynote address this morning is Turkey as a cultural bridge between Europe and the Arab world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for His Excellency, the Honorable Yasser Yakesh. Thank you. Dear Mark, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in this uh, uh, friendly atmosphere with new faces. Some of them are old faces. Uh, the subject that I'm going to develop on is a little boring, so only those who uh, uh, spend the night without sleeping are allowed to fall asleep during my lecture. The others are not allowed to, uh, to fall asleep. Uh, the subject uh, that I'm going to develop on uh, was framed as globalization of multiculturalism. That part, of course, uh, needs a little uh, further elaboration also. Uh, what is globalization of multi multiculturalism? If the globalization is intensification of relations between nations in all fields, then we may uh, see that uh, there is a strong interaction between globalization on the one hand 
and multi multiculturalism on the other hand. Why? Because the more the, the world is globalized, that say the borders lose the importance and the people each, uh, understand each other more, then of course uh, the cultures get in touch with each other and that there are interaction between the cultures. So this interaction between the cultures encourages the globalization, makes it easier, and then it turns back to the uh, multiculturalism. It also increases further the uh, multiculturalism. So we may see a direct interaction in between the two. One strengthens the other. And in this sense, we may even say that we, by inventing new words, uh, we may uh, talk of the multiculturalization of the globalization, changing the place of, the, of these two concepts. That's the globalization of multiculturalism is one thing. Multiculturalization of the globalization in the sense that giving more emphasis to the globalization in the cultural field. Because globalization has, has I mean, there are several different definitions of the globalization. Uh, intensification of relation in all fields. This includes cultures, but it also includes business, political, and the other areas. So if we give more emphasis to the cultural dimension of it, then we may talk of a of new concept of multiculturalization of the globalization. Now, what does it have to do with the subject that I'm going to uh, talk to you about? That's uh, Turkey as a bridge, Turkey's role as a bridge between, the, uh, uh, between Europe and the Arab countries. First of all, I would like to uh, Dwell, uh, say a few words on why Turkey is chosen, chosen as a bridge and perhaps not other countries. Because Turkey is not an Arab country and Turkey is not an Islamic country. Uh, we say for Turkey that Turkey is a secular country with predominantly Muslim population. This is different from an Islamic country. And when we refer to the member countries of the uh, organization of the Islamic Conference, we avoided always the reference to Islamic countries, the word Islamic countries. Because there may be secular countries among the Islamic countries. So rather than calling them Islamic countries, it is better to call them member countries of the Islamic Conference organization. So Turkey is not an Arab country. Turkey is not an Islamic country, like Islamic Republic of Iran, Islamic Republic of uh, Pakistan. It's not like that. For this reason, we may wonder, for instance, why we don't refer to Iran as a bridge between Europe and the, uh, uh, and the Arab countries. Because Iran is also a very sophisticated country, very advanced country. It has a statehood tradition of that is five, 2,500 years old. So Iran could also be mentioned that, uh, in that context. Why Turkey is mentioned? It is the secular character of Turkey. Secularism is a constitutional order in Turkey. And I will uh, uh, dwell uh, on it in, in further detail. Now, uh, let me say a few words regarding the, whether Turkey can constitute a bridge between uh, Europe and the Arab countries. It depends what we understand when we say constituting a bridge. If it is in the sense of whether the European countries have to use Turkey in order to reach Arab countries. In this sense, no, it is not a bridge because every European country can reach any Arab country without going through Turkey, without needing Turkey's uh, 
mediation or Turkey's role as a bridge. France does not need to reach uh, Tunisia or Algeria or Morocco. Uh, Turkey's help uh, to reach these countries. On the contrary, perhaps Turkey would need France's role as a bridge to reach these uh, Maghreb countries. So what is there which makes Turkey as a bridge? It is the, the distance that Turkey has covered in the democratization and its experience on secularization. And in this uh, conference, I will only dwell on these two aspects of uh, Turkey's experience, whether it could constitute a source of inspiration for the Arab countries, whether the Turkish secularism could constitute uh, uh, an, a good experience, a source of inspiration, and whether Turkey's democratic experience with its failures and with its success stories, can, could it constitute a source of inspiration? Uh, before doing so, perhaps it may be appropriate to remember uh, how certain Arab countries went through this, what we call the Arab Spring process. It started in uh, Tunisia, and Tunisia completed the transition, or the first part of the transition, first phase of the transition, in relatively short time. Of course, difficulties may continue. After the uh, Arab Spring in Tunisia, the, the party which emerged the, the strongest, a Nahta party, is a party of Islamist root, and it was led by a person who was put in jail in Tunisia because of his anti-secular activities. So he had to live in France and in, uh, in Britain for uh, several decades in, in, in uh, exile. So, uh, I'm talking about Mr. Rashid Hanushi. When a Nahta party emerged as the strongest party, the fears both in uh, Tunisia and in the international community was that now that these Muslim brothers uh, are taking power, emerged as the strongest party, then they may try to impose Sharia in their country. So the very first statement made by Mr. Ghanoushi was that they will not impose Sharia when they come to power, first thing. Second thing, that they will not force ladies to wear scarf. And thirdly, they will not ban uh, service, serving alcohol in the restaurants. Why did he say so? Because these three elements were perhaps the ones that occupied the mind of liberals in Tunisia, he needed the support of liberals also, and also international community. So he said this. Later on, was he able to fulfill these promises to a certain extent? Yes, but he encountered difficulties also. Salafi is there in, in Tunisia, started to demonstrate in the streets, so not to lose one part of its electorate power basis, he made concessions to the Salafis. He ignored their demonstrations. He did not repress them harshly. Why? Because in democracies, you need the support of everyone which is in the society. As uh, uh, Mr. Obama was saying in his uh, speech, now that this, uh, the elections are over and uh, Obama is elected, he will work with all segments of the society. You need the support of all segments of society, whether they voted for you or not. This is what Mr. Anushi has done in order to gather, first, to, to dispel the concerns and doubts and misgivings 
of the audience, both in Tunisia and abroad, to begin with. Later on, he also had to make concessions to the Salafis there in order not to lose part of its, of, of its power basis in Tunisia. What happened in Libya? In Libya, Libya was actually, in practice, Gaddafi regime was more secular than many other countries in, in the Arab world, despite the, the rules, despite the fact that the rules are the same, but the practice, reflection on it in the daily life was more secular. And perhaps as, as a result of this or as a result of other reasons, when the elections were held, liberals turned out to be the strongest. And it was the liberals who were asked to, to form the government. And when uh, the uh, government of uh, Ali Zaydan was formed, now we see that those who held weapons in their hand are attacking the intelligence uh, service uh, building and force the prime minister to expel from the government those who served uh, in the Qaddafi times in important places. This fight will continue. Of course, when uh, there are revolution, insurrection, or that type of uh, disturbance in a country, you cannot ignore half of the society which was against the, the regime. If you do it, then you will alienate that part of the public opinion, which is very dangerous because the society is formed by all type of tendencies. And when you come to power, it's all yours. You have to look after all, refer uh, all uh, tendencies. So now in Libya, we see that there are, again, a remnants of the past which surfaces and uh, behind it, of course, there may be other reasons, such as getting the control of oil exploration and uh, oil uh, wealth, etc. Uh, and there may be even international forces uh, that may incite that type of uh, disturbances in, in a country. But it's a fact of life that one, a country should try to embrace, a, a government should try to embrace all segments of the society, especially after this type of uh, disturbances. What happened in Egypt? In Egypt, again, Muslim brothers uh, won the power. And uh, initially, the Muslim brothers said that they will not designate a candidate for the presidency of the republic. Later on, for a reason which could be justified in the eyes of liberals in Egypt and also international community, they said, if we do not designate a candidate for the presidency, then the next biggest party is Salafist. So the Salafis will designate and they will won. So for this reason, we changed our mind and we are now going to put the candidacy of Mr. Morsi. And he became president now. Of course, in Egypt, the game is not over. It will take years, perhaps decades, we do not know. In Turkey, it took six decades to bring Turkey from the time of the multi-party democracy to the some sort of democracy that we have in Turkey. Turkey is far from being a paradise of democracy, but it is a democracy which is ahead of many countries of the region. So we arrived at this stage after six decades with all discrepancies that is still there. And uh, I don't think that it will take uh, that many decades for other countries of the Middle East to achieve this distance, I mean, to cover this distance, because the world is accelerating and everything happens uh, more uh, quickly. And Egypt is a very sophisticated society, so I don't think that it will take that long for Egypt, but it will take time, definitely. This is for sure. 
And uh, in Syria, there are a lot of lessons that we have to learn from the experience in other countries. The very first of them is that when you distribute weapons in order to help the people to overthrow the government, you never know in whose hand these weapons will end up. And now the weapons that were distributed in Libya are being used in order to destabilize the present government. In Syria, something similar may happen. So this is the reason why, to begin with the United States, international community has started to put a break uh, on the supply of lethal arms. Of course, to protect oneself, you need arms, but lethal arms killing people, then they, they, they put a break on it. Uh, we will see from this morning onward, uh, or tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening in the, uh, in the United States, what will uh, Mr. Obama do after his election? Because many people thought that Obama uh, could not make his uh, opinion uh, clear on Syria because he thought that this expression of his opinion will bring him uh, further down as compared to uh, Mitt Romney and uh, he kept this secret for himself and we will see what is this secret. But most probably, following the general tendency of the United, uh, United States public opinion that does not want to send his children to be killed in uh, overseas countries, uh, America will not get uh, involved directly by sending American soldiers to Syria, but whether they will continue to uh, provide lethal weapons to Syria, uh, we will see it. I hope that the wisdom will prevail there also, because every single weapon that enters the Syrian soil will be used to kill someone. It may be used to kill the uh, proponents of the regime, supporters of the regime, or it may be used to kill the demonstrators. But in all circumstances, it's a Syrian human being that is going to be killed. So uh, the, the introduction of any uh, weapon in Syria is going to aggravate the situation for Syrians who are fighting in between themselves. It may turn later on into in, internal war. It may turn into chaos. It may turn uh, Syria to a battlefield of proxy war, wars of other countries. Uh, America uh, fighting against Iran in the Syrian soil by letting the Syrian people being killed. So this may happen. So we will see uh, how this situation will continue. Now, of course, these were unnecessary details perhaps for the cultural diplomacy, but I had to say that everything makes and affects the, uh, the evolution of the cultural diplomacy. Now I come to uh, Turkey, and I said that I will uh, elaborate in further detail two things. One was the secularism. The other is Turkey's exper experience in democratization. Secularism was introduced in Turkey in 1930s. So it's almost now uh, 80 years that secularism is being practiced in Turkey. Is, it, is secularism a, a constitutional, a, a principle enshrined in the constitution and forgotten there? No. It is internalized, digested by the people, owned by the people, and defended by the people. I remember an example of uh, several decades. It was in 1970s, I think. The mayor of a provincial town in Turkey issued a municipal decree saying that in the month of Ramadan, the restaurants will be kept closed because it's Ramadan and it's a Muslim country according to his assessment. 
A restaurant keeper stood up and said, I am a pious Muslim, but in a secular country, I don't let these municipality people to decide on my behalf whether I will keep my restaurant closed or open. And he went to the court to cancel this law, this municipal decree. But he lost the case in the, in the court because somewhere in the Turkish legislation it said that the opening and closing hours of the public places are regulated by the municipalities. Then he went to the constitutional court and got this law canceled. And when he got the constitutional court verdict, he said, now that everyone knows in this country that in a secular country, the municipality people have no right to interfere in the religion of individuals, he said, I will still close my restaurant, but I will do it on my own volition. Everybody knows that in a secular country, you don't interfere in things which is between individuals and God. It is secularism, the, the essence of the secularism is to leave the religion to between people, individuals, and their God. This is also what Mr. Erdogan, the Prime Minister of Turkey, uh, said in, in a speech that he delivered in Cairo. When he arrived in Cairo, he was met by the Muslim brothers at the airport with big uh, demonstrations, etc. And when he uh, pronounced, a, uh, uh, delivered a lecture saying that, I am a pious Muslim, but I am the prime minister of a secular country. And I don't interfere in what individuals do with their God. It's their problem. I do not interfere in Muslims' affairs, in Christians' affairs, in Jews, and in atheist affairs, because atheists also are the citizens of my country. I have the responsibility to, to protect their belief as well. Upon which Muslim brothers there said that Mr. Erdogan's uh, speech must have been uh, translated in a wrong manner. But he insisted that, he said, no, it's not, it is translated properly. Perhaps the word that they used wa was slightly Egyptianized. Those who speak Arabic may know that there are three different words in Arabic for secularism. One is Almaniye, which means science-minded approach, Almaniye. The other is La Diniye which means without religion. The third is Medeniye, which is used in Egypt. And when they translated to Medeniye, Mr. Ergan said, no, it's not Medeniye, it is secularism, he said in Turkish again. And uh, of course, I don't know then what other words were, was taken instead of it. So all these unnecessary detail, details that may look unnecessary for you, shows that secularism is something that has to be digested properly and implemented properly. And it is not only by changing laws that you could achieve this. You may put in your constitution and in the secondary leg uh, legislation every uh, details of the secularism, but if the culture of secularism did not develop enough in the country, then there will be this discrepancies. In the example that I gave you of this municipal decree, you see that individuals own secularism. It is thanks to that type of insistence and owning and defense of the individuals that the secularism surfaces and also is implemented. So what is the difference of Turkey as compared to many, I will use the technical term that I will use, to many other members of the Islamic Conference Organization to avoid the word Islamic countries because some countries may not consider themselves as Islamic countries. It's not Islamic Republic of Egypt, it is 
Arab Republic of Egypt. So when we say Egypt, to what extent they consider themselves as Islamic, it's up to them. But member countries of Islamic conference organization is perhaps more technical term. I will, I'm using this term on purpose for, for this particular purpose. So what makes Turkey different from the others is that this secularism is digested and internalized and owned by the people. And it is thanks, this, thank, thanks to this feature that makes Turkey different from other countries. What is the result of this in the cultural field? It is the way the rights, fundamental rights and freedom are used. And fundamental rights and freedom or the utilization or use of fundamental rights and freedom is perhaps the, one of the most important features of cultural differences in between the countries. When you look at one country and, and compare with the others, well, you say this is a different culture. When you go in it, then these type of elements of secularism will play the most important role there. So Turkey is different from that standpoint from many other member countries of the Islamic Conference Organization and including Arab countries. Because when you say Arab countries, it is not monolith. Arab countries are so different from each other. So the criteria that you will use for one of them will not be valid for the other. Uh, so Turkey, if it can constitute a bridge, the one source of inspiration is this secular character of Turkish Republic. The second is the process of democratization. It is a long process. Uh, Turkey adopted the multi-party uh, political system in 1946. Before that, we made uh, attempt to, for the multi-party system in 1932, but it was upon the instructions of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. He told that uh, one of his closest colleagues, he said, this is one party government, and the, when, we, when Turkey is looked from outside, it doesn't look nice as a one-party system. It's a dictatorial system. So why don't you establish a party and, uh, and, uh, and uh, act as an as a opposition party? So upon the instruction of uh, Mustafa Kemal, one of his closest uh, friends, actually that gentleman was his boss when that boss was ambassador in Sofia, and Mustafa Kemal Atatürk was military attaché there. So they had a friendship from there. So he instructed that man to establish the party. But in the real sense, democratic sense, in the Western sense of democracy, multi-party system was, was introduced in Turkey in 1946. And but even today, as I said, uh, there are several discrepancies in Turkey's democracy that we have to complete, to fulfill, and to, to, to cover the, the gaps, but it will take time. Uh, so when you say democracy, it is a, it's a more uncertain and wide area. I will take one example that I personally witnessed in my person, the establishment of the present ruling party in Turkey. I am one of the founding members, as uh, Mark mentioned, uh, when he was reading my uh, CV. I am one of the founding members of this uh, ruling party in Turkey. And uh, as a young party that we established in 2001, after 15 months old, we participated in the election and uh, we won two thirds of the seats in the parliament. And uh, this party, the parent of this party, was an Islamist party. So I will say in further detail how this transition from this Islamist route turned to become a secular party. This Islamist party, which was led by a certain Mr. Nejmeddin Erbakan, was dissolved in 1990s because of its 
anti-secular activities. Then, when the party was dissolved, the members of the parliament from that party reorganized themselves under another name. But the Constitutional Court dissolved this second party also, because it is composed of the same persons. So if the name changes, it doesn't change the character of the party. So it dissolved the second party as well. Then Mr. Abdullah Gül, who is now president of the Republic, stood up and said, oh my colleagues, we cannot progress like this by fighting the secular regime of Turkey. Secularism is something that we have to digest and abide by its rules. And he further said that when we take oath in the parliament after being elected, you come to the rostrum in the parliament and you say, I swear on my uh, everything, gods and or uh, perhaps other things, I do not remember exact sentence, I, I swear that I will remain faithful to the secular principles of the republic. So when you take oath, you already say that you are going to remain secular. So Mr. Gül said, this is our oath. If we betray our oath, then we will be betraying our God because, I mean, it is, you, you, you take oath on your sanctities, uh, whatever is saint for you. And the party is divided into two. Mr. Abdullah Gül became the leader of the reformist group of the party, and the others remained conservative wing of the party. And later on, this reformist group decided to transform itself into a new political party. It is at that time that Mr. Gül gave me a ring, called me, and said, my group has decided to transform itself into a political party. Would you like to come and join us as a founding member of the party? I had come very recently from my last posting in Vienna, and I was not interested in politics at all. And I did not know what it meant to become founding member. And I went to his office and I said, Mr. Gil, if you forgive me for my ignorance, I don't know what it means to become founding member of the party. Is it something important, I said, or is it just an etiquette, a label? He said, after all, it's a label, but a very important label, he said. Then I consulted other people and I joined them. Then I became part of this group. I give these details in order to show you how this party that came from the Islamist root transformed itself into a secular party. Then we carried out a huge public opinion poll. Record number of interviewees were interviewed. 42,000 people were interviewed. And then it turned out as a result of this uh, uh, poll that 46% of the public opinion at the time in Turkey were discontent of the then existing political parties and they were in search of a new political formation. And from the uh, supplementary questions that we asked, we found out that their first priority was food, work, job, security, justice, and that type of things. For instance, the headscarf issue, which was very lively dis discussed in Turkey, was not a priority at all. It was priority number seven or, or nine. So we drafted uh, our part program, and I am one of the six-man committee that drafted the uh, program of the party. We tried to respond these expectations of the 46% of the population. And again, from the additional question that we asked, we found out that 6% out of these 46% have voted for the extreme right parties in the last elections. 
And another 5 to 6% voted for the extreme left. And we wondered at that time, what should be our strategy? The, the sole party of Erbakan enjoyed something like 13% of the public opinion support at the time they were dissolved. It was divided into two. So we wondered whether we should try to embrace the 6.5% of this dissolved party, the second half, or shall we turn to this 46%? We decided to turn to 46%. With the exception of these right extremists and left extremists, because you cannot combine these two in, in your program. And they had their own parties. They will not vote for other parties. So we thought that we should remain in the middle. And curiously enough, in the elections, we obtained exactly 34% of the votes. 34 compared to 46 means 46 minus 6% right. Again, minus 6% left, it makes 34%. This is the vote that we obtained. It means that when we choose the right words in our program, that's to say we avoided any reference to any religion in our party. The name of any religion was not mentioned and said afterward that our party is equidistant on equal distance to the Christianity, to Judaism, to Islam, and to atheism. So this is how the party, which came from an Islamist root, became the party that won two-thirds of the seats in the parliament. So this was what I was trying to say. If the parties, political parties in Arab Spring countries could take this experience as a source of inspiration in their transformation, perhaps they may also win two-thirds of the seats in the parliament. In some, they have already do it without. In Egypt, for instance, they maintained Article 2 of the Mubarak time constitution, which says that main source of the legislation in Egypt is Sharia. This is maintained in the present uh, constitution. So it may be difficult to introduce secularism in this country. But Egypt is a country with secular practices. But when you run into trouble, like the case of this restaurant keeper, it is at that time that you understand what is secularism and what is uh, Sharia. I don't know whether you remember, if there are Egyptians among you, they will remember. When I was serving as ambassador in Egypt, there was an uh, Ahmed Abu Zaid case. Ahmed Abu, professor Ahmed Abu Zaid was a professor in the Arab language and literature. Somebody said that he committed the crime of apostasy, denying God apostasy. And he was taken to the court. The court decided that a, a team of the al Azhar professors should meet and examine his books. And they examined, I'm going to conclude. And they, led the they were led to the conclusion that yes, Abu Zaid committed the crime of apostasy. In Islam, if you commit the crime of apostasy, you are liable of the death penalty. You, you could be killed. Then he sought asylum at the uh, Dutch embassy in Cairo, this gentleman. Then someone came up and said that, according to Islam, a Muslim girl cannot be married to an apostate. And he said, I want the, the judge to divorce this man from that lady, for Ahmed Abu Zaid. Then the country was alarmed. I'm going to conclude in a few moments' time. 
and uh, then Egyptians had to change amend their uh, cons uh, law saying that a man in the street is not allowed to ask divorce. He could only alert the public prosecutor to do so. And when I asked an, uh, a good friend of mine, Egyptian friend, is it only that far yet that you could go? He said, it is because we did not have a Mustafa Kemal Atatürk in our country to introduce secularism. So this is where we stand. We are both two countries, Egypt and Turkey, with secular practices. But when you run into trouble, in Egypt it ends in one way, in Turkey it ends another way. So these, these are where Turkey could be considered as a bridge between Europe and the uh, Arab countries. And I will stop here. And uh, if there are questions, I will try to uh, answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yakish. And I thought that was a great way to begin the, uh, the conference. And I think you've inspired many questions and many, uh, many comments also from the audience. However, uh, we're running behind schedule. So what I was thinking of doing, if both speakers would agree, we'll have the two keynote addresses. And then both speakers will be here for the interactive discussion. And that will give us a chance multilaterally uh, to, on the one hand, ask questions maybe to, to the speakers, as well as to discuss these issues in a multilateral way. Uh, so if, if you would both agree, I think that would be great. That will allow also the, the next speaker a chance to speak. Uh, but really, it was very, very... Uh, a thoughtful, a very, very generous uh, presentation, really about not only Turkey, but the, the entire region. So I'd ask you us, uh, to please join me in extend, extending maybe a second round of applause for His Excellency Yasser Yakesh. Thank you.